Welcome everyone to this Age of Empires 2 video and today we're taking a look at the history of the civilizations featured in the new DLC for Age of Empires 2, Dynasties of India. Now let's start off with the Bengalis. During the 6th century AD, the Gupta Empire was struggling to remain unified in the face of internal volatility and external invasions. Seizing the opportunity, Shashanka, a chieftain in modern-day Bengal, broke away and founded his own kingdom in Gauda. While he laid the foundations for future Bengali states and even implemented a new calendar, Shashanka would not be long outlived by his kingdom, which was consumed by his rivals soon after his death. Roughly a century later, Bengal remained in turmoil with no central ruling power. However, around the mid 8th century, the Bengali people, according to legend, elected Gopala, the king of the region. This consensual vesting of power was crucial as it allowed Gopala to form a new centralized state, the Pala Empire. Under Gopala's successors, Dharmapala and Devapala, the Pala Empire became a major player on the Indian subcontinent, contending with the rival Rashtrakutas and the Pratiharas for supremacy in the Kannauj Triangle. Devapala raised Pala power to new heights but nearly squandered his state-building achievements when a disastrous Pyrrhic expedition to the far south withered his army and destabilized his state. Recognizing his mistake, he made a spectacular recovery during the later years of his reign and passed on a formidable realm to his successors. Under Pala rule, Bengal and the surrounding regions reached unprecedented levels of economic, political and military strength. The trade routes along the Ganges and the Bay of Bengal exploded with activity and the Bengali agricultural and material wealth was matched by none. Indeed, the economy of Bengal alone outstripped all of Europe at the time. Pala emperors commanded vast armies of elephants, infantry and notably ratas, battle chariots that had fallen out of use in much of the Indian subcontinent. Mahayana Buddhism also flourished in the Pala lands, and the emperors patronized several monasteries, universities, and other public works projects to educate and supply their subjects. As the Pala Empire declined during the 12th century, the vast array of realms that it controlled began to assert their independence. During this time, the neighboring Sena dynasty took the opportunity to wrest control of several of these away from the Palas and gradually assume control over Bengal and most of the former Pala possessions. Sena hegemony ended nearly as quickly as it rose. However, by the early 13th century, the rising Delhi Sultanate had thrust east towards Bengal and quickly seized much of the region. This marked a considerable religious watershed moment as well as Islam which would eventually become a majority religion in Bengal. Islam was first introduced in significant volume to Bengali lands during this time. During the 14th century, Ilyas Shah emerged victorious among a group of squabbling generals and warlords, establishing the Bengal Sultanate. It was this period that saw Bengal match and surpass the prosperity of the Pala Empire, becoming famed across continents for its wealth and cultural vibrance. One particularly famous product was Jamdani, also known as muslin, after its iteration in the Middle East, a cloth prized as a luxury item. The Bengali Sultanate retained its exalted status until the 16th century, when it was absorbed into the rising Mughal Empire. The Dravidians. While the Guptas ruled in the north, the south half of the Indian subcontinent was ruled by a separate series of dynasties. One, the Chalukyas, expanded south from the Deccan Plateau and formed a large but far-flung and volatile dominion. As time wore on, a new power came into being, the Rashtrakuta dynasty, which formed a considerably more powerful state. For generations, the Rashtrakutas vied with the Bengali Palas and the Gurjara Pratiharas for supremacy in the so-called Kannauj Triangle. Alongside the Rashtrakutas rose another entity, the Pandyas, 
of South India under able rulers such as Kadungan and Srimara. The Pandyas ruled much of the coast along the Bay of Bengal, engaging at times, not always by choice, in the Kannauj Triangle rivalry. The region that they ruled was a prominent node along a healthy trade network spanning the Indian subcontinent and its surrounding oceans. However, both realms nearly faced ruin and narrowly avoided catastrophe when the Pala Emperor Devapala launched an ambitious campaign to the far south to expand his already vast realm. The power vacuum and instability created by this and other events directly enabled the rise to supremacy of another great power, the Chola Empire. Although based primarily in southern India and Sri Lanka, the Cholas, led by intrepid rulers such as the Raja Raja and Rajendra, expanded their sphere of influence northeast to coastal Bengal as well as to southeast Asia. Rajendra Chola allied himself with Suryavarman I of the Khmer Empire to crush Srivijaya, a maritime empire based primarily in Sumatra and Malaysia. The Chola fleet was among the most powerful of its time, being meticulously organized and well equipped. Comprising a wide array of vessel types, it could crush enemy navies in small scale engagements or swarm and overwhelm them with sheer numbers. Southern India was also remarkably technologically advanced. One of its more famous products was Woots, a predecessor of modern steel. Dravidian weapons fashioned of this substance were stronger, deadlier, and more durable than their counterparts elsewhere. This technology eventually spread along trade routes to the Middle East, where it became known as Damascus steel, and finally into Europe. Weaponry from this region was also innovative in nature. One prominent example is the Yurumi, a flexible blade that was wielded like a whip. Yurumis had an uncanny ability to circumvent defences and inflict dreadful lacerations. As the Chola Empire declined, a second wave of Pandya dominance replaced it. However, at this time, further adversities emerged. Scions of the Delhi Sultanate now made regular incursions south in an attempt to conquer the remainder of the Indian subcontinent. Nevertheless, a new power rose in response to these threats. The Vijayangara Empire. This formidable state harnessed the strength of its predecessors, but would also import gunpowder weaponry from European merchants who frequented the region. Though successful for a while, Vijayangara was eventually overwhelmed by the steady pressure of invasions from the north. The Gurjaras After the collapse of the Gupta Empire in the 6th century AD, its former possessions fragmented into a patchwork of successor states ruled by various chieftains and dynasties. During the 8th century, a king named Nagabata took command of the region, inaugurating the Pratihara dynasty, also known as Gurjara Pratihara, for the region that the Pratihara kings ruled. The Pratiharas participated prominently in the Kannauj Triangle rivalry, fighting the Rashtrakutas and Bengali Palas for control of Kannauj and the lands surrounding it. One especially noteworthy monarch, Mihira Boja, expanded the Pratihara realm throughout all of Gujarat and beyond. Various sources describe his prowess as a ruler and the vastness of his armies making specific reference to a cavalry force riding Shrivamsha horses, a breed noted for their elite levels of speed, endurance and agility. The Pratihara kings also had to contend with increasingly large Muslim invasions across the Hindu Kush. While initially successful in fending them off, the Pratihara realms suffered from a process of attrition brought on by these various conflicts and weakened considerably over time. The dynasty's death knell rang in the early 11th century when Mahmud Ghaznavi's army sacked Kannauj, displacing the Pratihara ruling family. The Pratiharas were not the only noteworthy players in northwestern India at this time. Also figuring into the power struggle over this fruitful region were the Chandelas, Paramaras, Solankis and Sumros of Sindh. These and several other states contributed to a vast amount of cultural, linguistic and religious variety in this part of the world. Their differences at times bred rivalry, 
but more often, this remarkable diversity was an emblem of cultural transfer and convergence, with conflicts being primarily politically motivated. During the 12th century, much of North and Northwestern India came under the hegemony of Prithviraj Chauchan of Ajmer, a powerful ruler in Rajputana. Prithviraj, whose story survives principally in the epic Prithviraj Raso, put down a relative's revolt, subdued several neighboring states, and married Sanyogita, the daughter of his rival Jayachandra. This union had disastrous consequences, as a jealous advisor conspired with Jayachandra to overthrow Prithviraj by inviting the zealous armies of Muhammad Ghori to invade. Although Prithviraj initially held off the waves of Ghorid invaders, he was slain and his kingdom then succumbed to conquest. Muhammad Ghori's successor, Qutub ad-Din Aybak, went on to found the Delhi Sultanate in 1206. The Delhi Sultanate overextended itself, leading several regions to splinter off during the 14th and 15th centuries. Three prominent powers during this time were the Gujarat and Malwa Sultanates and the Sisodias of Mewa, all of which retained power until the rise of the Mughal Empire. While Gujarat and Malwa fell to the Mughals during the 16th century, Mewa survived somewhat longer thanks to the efforts of its valiant ruler, Maharana Pratap, who fought the Mughals to a stalemate. His successors took up the fight, but after further military impasses, negotiated an agreement, retaining autonomy while recognizing Mughal supremacy. The Hindustanis As the medieval period dawned, the northern regions of modern-day India were ruled primarily by the Gupta Empire. At its zenith, under Chandragupta II, Vikramaditya, this short-lived state stretched from the Indus River to the Ganges Delta. While exceptionally advanced for its time in economic, political, military, intellectual and social terms, the Gupta Empire was overextended and vulnerable to external invasions. Nomadic incursions from the northwest posed a constant problem, as did the extremes of the local climates. Flooding, in particular, was a major issue. This state would not outlive the 6th century AD, but it left a significant imprint on the polities that succeeded it. After the Gupta Empire fell, its possessions passed to the control of countless major and minor entities. These never matched the power of the Guptas, but they inherited its strengths and advancements. A sophisticated division of labour system, significant scientific achievements, bustling trade networks, and powerful military technology, to name a few. Sanskrit epics tell of a powerful and magnanimous 7th century ruler, Harsha Vardhana, who forged some of these polities into a pseudo-empire, but his state too had relatively little longevity. The next couple of centuries saw the emergence of a new threat as waves of Muslim invasions cascaded into the Indian subcontinent, while Indian magnates such as Bapa Rawal initially succeeded in stemming the onrushing tide. This threat gradually grew too much for the often fragmented Indian states to muster sustained resistances. Beyond the Hindu Kush, powerful Turco-Persian Muslim dynasties were rising. The Ghaznavids had formed a formidable state in modern Afghanistan, Pakistan and Iran. One particularly infamous ruler, Mahmud Ghaznavi, launched 17 separate campaigns to pillage much of North and West India. Following the Ghaznavids were the Ghorids, another powerful dynasty that toppled the Ghaznavids and thrust further into India during the 12th and 13th centuries. Both factions were notable for the heavy use of Ghulams, former slaves who had been trained as professional soldiers, creating a warrior elite that dominated both battlefields and palaces. The Ghorid invasions were a watershed moment due to their permanent impact, whereas their predecessors had merely led campaigns of pillaging and destruction. The Ghorids, under the brothers Giyath and Muhammad, defeated Prithviraj Chauchan of Ajma and established permanent control over much of northern India. Their successor, Qutb ad-Din Aybak, created a new superpower, the Delhi Sultanate, which essentially consisted of a Muslim warrior elite ruling over a culturally and socially majority Indian population. Like many of history's conquerors, the Delhi Sultans deemed it infinitely more prudent to perpetuate the existing systems in their new empire 
than to attempt to tear them down and impose their own. The following centuries were tumultuous ones. The Delhi Sultanate and its neighbours were rattled by successive Mongol invasions which, while achieving no significant lasting gains, gutted the region's infrastructure. Particularly brutal was the Timur Tamerlane's invasion of 1398, which tore through northern India and reduced the glorious city of Delhi to a charnel house. Over a century later, the Mughal conqueror Babur, yet another persified warlord from Central Asia, would remark in his autobiographical Babur Nama that he observed a land not yet healed from the ravages of the past centuries. Nevertheless, Babur was able to mould the weakened northern India polities that he conquered into a powerful state, the Mughal Empire, which would rule the region from 1526 well into the early modern period. So I hope you guys enjoyed taking a look at these civilizations for the new downloadable content Dynasties of India and if you did do give the video a thumbs up. Take care guys and see you next time.